pleasure to introduce to you uh, a very dear, very old friend of mine, Mark Pesci. Uh, Mark and I went to high school many decades ago. Uh, Mark is an inventor, writer, entrepreneur, uh, educator, and a broadcaster. I'll just give you a very brief bio of Mark over the last 20 years. In 1994, he was a co-inventor of Vermal, virtual reality, virtual reality modeling language, a 3D uh, interface to the World Wide Web. He's the author of six books, including Vermal, Browsing and Building Cyberspace, and also The Playful World, How Technology is Transforming Our Imagination, which uses toys such as Furby, an old school toy, uh, <laughs> and Sony's PlayStation to uh, explore an interactive future. As an educator, uh, Mark founded a graduate program in interactive media at both the University of Southern California's World Famous Cinema School and the Australian Film, Radio, and Television School. Um, he currently holds an appointment as an honorary associate in the University of Sydney's Digital Cultures Program. For seven years, uh, Mark was a panelist and judge for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation's hit television series, The New Inventors, that celebrated Australia's new inventions and inventors. And I can tell you, I went to Australia a few years ago, and Mark is famous in Australia. People do know who he is as the American, the American judge. It was a hoot, I have to tell you. And they, they say his name like they do in his native town in Massachusetts. Um, so anyway, so last year, Mark was appointed a columnist uh, for the IT publication, The Register, a British technology website that reaches a global audience with provocative articles and the London of the connected world. And he recently launched um, this week in Startups Australia, which is the number one tech podcast in Australia. So it is my pleasure again to introduce my dear friend Mark, who will keep us entertained for the next hour. So. Uh, to be quite clear, I have known this man for 37 yeah. years. <laughs> All right, to give you some idea, I don't think ever either of us ever realized we would ever be this old. Yes, that's true. <laughs> I certainly never thought he would be this distinguished. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I'll take it to dinner time. Yeah, exactly. This is, this is how Australians show affection with one another. They, they rip each other mercilessly. OK. So I want to talk about where we are and where we're going in the world of education. And I need to start by telling you about something that happened to me a few months ago in Sydney. Now, I am lucky enough that I get to spend some time every year judging a competition. And the competition is called Young ICT Explorers. Now, this is kids who are anywhere from second grade all the way up to 12th grade who are creating technology projects. And on a rainy Saturday afternoon in August in Sydney, which is the middle of our winter, so you can think of it as being the middle of February there, although I should point out that it was about 60 degrees <laughs> in the dead of winter in Sydney, not six. <laughs> um, we got together, and here's 280 students from 28 different schools, all across New South Wales. New South Wales has a population of about six million, about four million of them live in Sydney and Sydney suburbs. And all different age groups. Now I'm a judge, and there's a lot of judges, and the judges will judge a number of different projects. And there's a big cohort of, cohort of projects that are submitted by kids in years five and six, because that's just before they go into middle school and they go into high school and they start having lots of separate little classes and they lose the free time they need to be able to spend a lot of time on a project. And I spend the morning sitting down with each of these folks, and here's one group of kids, sixth graders, with their little technology projects, and I sit down and I ask them a bunch of questions, and they get to ask me a bunch of questions, and the teachers are nowhere to be found, and the parents are nowhere to be found. It's very one-on-one, -on -one. and so we actually learn what they've done. And I spent the morning doing this, and I was having a great time, and finally I get to the last project that I'm going to judge this morning, and I see a big white box that someone stuck a clock into, and then down below, that little area that's a little LED display, and running across the LED display is text. And I'm looking at this going, okay, let's see what's going on. So I go up to the young man, 11 years old, who has done this. And I said, well, what's going on here? He said, well, my elementary school is really, really, really crowded. And we have a really small playground. 
And there's a schedule for what time of day each class is allowed to use the playground. But no one can remember the schedule. So there are fights on the playground all the time when kids think they belong on the playground and they don't. So I made this clock so that kids could look at it and at the bottom it would tell them whether they were supposed to be on the playground or not. I said, okay. And I sat down and he had a computer screen here and he was showing some of the code that he had used to create it. And I actually know the coding environment he was using. And I looked at this and I saw this 11 year old has created this incredibly sophisticated control program that minute by minute tells the computer what message it should be displaying. And I have never seen such a sophisticated control program from an adult or child before. And he used a little piece of technology called the Raspberry Pi that maybe none of you have heard of. But it's a computer that's been designed specifically to help kids learn how to program. It was designed a couple of years ago in the UK because right now when kids see a computer, they see a finished device. They see a smartphone, they see a laptop. They have no idea what's going on inside. And for something that's so important to culture, it's really important to know what's going on inside. So these folks created this and allowed it to just grow out there so people could actually learn how it works. Okay, I see all of this and I am immediately very suspicious because <laughs> this is an 11 year old. And he seems to have done all this work. There's dad hanging on the background, but dad didn't say anything. There's no teacher around. So you did this, did you? Yes, I did. I then proceed to ask him a series of extremely detailed technical questions, as you do because you want to find out whether he really did it, or whether maybe a teacher did it, or dad did it, or whatever. And every question, he just gives me the full answer, just as I expect. And I know that he's not lying to me, because the answers are rolling off the top of his head. And I'm getting progressively blown away by this. And finally, I go, where did you learn all of this? He said, oh, I watched some videos on Adafruit. Now, you probably haven't heard of Adafruit because you don't necessarily play a lot with electronics. You've probably all heard of the maker movement. Perhaps you participate in the maker movement, which is this idea that you can do things yourself, you can create things yourself. Adafruit was started by a lovely woman in New York City back in 2008 to help grown-ups start to do things with technology. And it's got articles, it's got videos, it's got form, it's got everything that you need if you want to sort of dive in. I've used this site before when I've been trying to learn some things about electronics. What I had never thought about was what would happen when an 11 year old who essentially has an infinite capacity to learn when they're sufficiently engaged, what would happen when that 11 year old would mind map would merge with all of the resources that were available online with a website like this. Well, what would happen is he would be able to see a problem that he had in his school and be able to design his way to a solution for the problem. And let me tell you, he won the big prize that day because I was able to go to all the other judges who hadn't seen the project and go, have you seen this? <laughs> tell them, and we got the big prize for him. Now, this is the beginning of something we're going to see a lot of. It's something that defines what the learning environment is, not just for 11 year olds, but for all of us across the 21st century. And that's the first thing I want you to understand. Now, in order to understand that, we've got to step back a little bit. At the beginning of the 20th century, the mind of the child was a blank slate. We did not understand how the mind of the child worked. As far as anyone cared to think about it, the mind of the child was simply an unsophisticated version of the mind of the adult. And that was pretty much the end of the argument. And then someone came along and did an experiment that was, as Albert Einstein later put it, so simple only a genius could have thought of it. What this person did was simply watch children at play study what their understanding of the world was from how they were playing in the world. Now, do you all have any idea who I might be talking about did this? It's a man by the name of Jean Piaget, Swiss. 
He watched his, started with his own children, watched his own children as they were growing up. What he came to understand is that children are consistently, from the moment they're aware, observing the world, drawing things out of that observation, drawing theorems out of that observation, testing those theorem, theorems. Where those theorems are proved true, they become part of a structure of understanding, and where they fall over, you start again from that point. So children inherently <coughs> practice the scientific method. All of us do this. You don't have to be taught to do it. It's how we learn in the world. And so he took that and he said, this is constructivism, because the child is constructing a model of the world drawn from their interactions in the world. And this is the bedrock, the first understanding, the sort of fundamental understanding of how intelligence emerges in children in the world. Now, that understanding became the foundation for a whole generation of educators who were educated by Piaget. Piaget's career spanned most of the 20th century. He finally died, I think, in the 80s. And so he had a lot of time to train a lot of graduate students. And so what I want to do is give you a genealogy through two students, one of his students and then one of their students. And the first of those students, who is important, is a man by the name of Seymour Papert. Seymour Papert is the father of educational computing. And he's the father of educational computing because what he realized was that he could design systems for programming computers that children would be able to modify in conjunction with their own understanding. In other words, you could give a child a very simple system, but let that system be accretive. So if the child could add things to their understanding, the computer system would add things to its own understanding. So the computer language and the child's capability to do things on the computer would co-evolve. So it's constructivism. And when you do that, a child also gets an intrinsic understanding of math, because math is the thing that backs up how computers work. So when you give a child in an environment where they can play with their understanding and experiment, you also give them a playful environment to understand and experiment with math. So Packard went to MIT, did a lot of work in artificial intelligence. They figured out the first thing they understood from artificial intelligence is they didn't understand what human intelligence was. Worked on that for a while trained a bunch of graduate students. And from that crop of graduate students in the 1980s comes Mitchell Resnick. Mitchell Resnick is now at the Media Lab at MIT. He spent 10 years developing Lego's Mindstorms. Now, maybe you've seen them or heard of them. They came out originally in 1997. They're Mindstorms that have a whole bunch of components that allow them to be used as robots. Now, Lego is already the first sort of constructivist toy. It doesn't instruct the child to be able to do anything. You just sort of play with it and experiment. But then you add the intelligent components plus a programming environment. So you now have all of these pieces together so you can create your own robots by playing. That was the first level of it. But the other level of this was that this kit was introduced in 1997. And so on the right side of the screen, what you see is the Mindstorms website. Because the web was a thing in 1997. And so what you have is not just this kit, but you now have this idea that there's a kit, and everyone else who is doing something with that kit is sharing what they're doing with everyone else who has that kit. And that's millions of people with millions of kits. And what this means is that if I don't know what I'm doing with this kit, I can look around and see what other people are doing with that kit. Now, there's really two primary mechanisms for human learning. One is constructivist, the other is what they call mimesis. It's where we get the word mind from. We ate other people. If you ever take a look at a small child who has watched mommy or daddy using a smartphone or a tablet, they now start doing this in front of any surface. Why? Because they're minding the behavior. So you have 
this capacity to discover by experiment, and you have this capacity now to see what other people are doing. But it's not just to see what a few people are doing. You can now see what billions of people are doing. This is a phenomenon that I call hypermimesis, which is what happens when you get everyone connected and everyone learning from everyone else. And Mindstorms did really well for Lego. It's five hundred dollars a kit. They still sold a boatload of them. Resnick, just a few years ago, took the programming language behind Mindstorms and brought it out as a separate thing. And he called that programming language Scratch. And it did okay. And I remember at my first Yikti event, I could see a couple of Scratch programs. Last year, one of his graduate students took Scratch and put it inside of a web browser. And what that means now, that it's in a web browser, is that you can have a Scratch program and you can share it with everyone everywhere, or you can give it to anyone, or you can see anyone else's Scratch programs by going to the Scratch website. Do you know how many Scratch programs there are up on the Scratch website today? I checked. 8.27 million different Scratch programs that have all been written by kids all on the Scratch website. So you now have people who are playing, who are watching other people playing, and all of that is now producing a learning environment that is unique to the 21st century. That is the form for every student who walks into Columbia after this will have been participating in this culture. So it's not just something that has to do with technology. It's not just something that has to do with a computer language, but it is a new learning style that is driven by the fact that we are all very intently watching one another as we're learning. Right. Then we come to higher education. And uh, in America in particular, although this is true in Australia, in particular, in America, higher education has an unspoken but quite clear economic component. So this is a chart that I pulled out of the Atlantic on Friday, showing the relative earning potential of individuals who have high school degrees. They're earning about $25,000 a year. And then a recent college graduate that's about $58,000 a year. Stephen informed me that the annual tuition at Columbia is around $25,000 a year. Given the difference in earning potential between high school degree holders and college degree holders, that investment pays for itself in four years. Right? It pays for itself pretty much as quickly as it comes. And so there's this cultural sense that although I think we frame college for the betterment of the individual and the liberal arts education as the rounding of the individual, there's a backstop there which in fact says in modern 21st century culture there's an economic basis for it. And if for some reason you can't get into a college, you can't afford it or the circumstances aren't right for it, you end up being stuck down here at this bottom socioeconomic rung. And that ends up being a bit of a trap, because the longer that you're trapped at that space, at the bottom of the ladder, the less free time you're going to have to be able to educate yourself to some higher earning level, because you're going to be so busy just trying to survive. And so there's a real sense that at the bottom here, there's um, an inescapable situation where because you haven't been able to leverage the time and the energy into an education, you're never going to be able to do it. At least that's historically been the case because there's just not enough money at the bottom down there to be able to spend time improving your lot. And the folks down here, this is the part of the labor market that gets exploited. Right? Because it's the least powerful, it's the least enabled. 
Now, technology, which is something that I do study, has always been a very powerful agent of exploitation. I want to talk about that a little bit. And that's been the case for a long time. That's been the case since we sent slaves down to my tin back in England during the Roman era. Technology and exploitation have gone hand in hand. Of course, in the 21st century, we have much more fancy ways of exploiting connected or of connect, uh, unskilled labor. Because in the 21st century, we now have a capacity to aggregate labor in ways that we did not have until very recently. And the dictionary example of an aggregated labor market in the new 21st century form is Uber. So Uber, have you all used an Uber? How many of you, wait, how many of you hate Uber? Okay, good. So I just needed to sort of check that. Uh, I don't hate Uber. I look at Uber. <laughs> as a, a force of nature. I think it's probably the better way to put it. Okay, so what does Uber do? The basic insight behind Uber is that you have a whole bunch of folks who have their own capital. They have a car. Originally, it was a limousine. Now it's anyone. We'll go into that. Originally, it was a limousine. All of these people owned limousines, and they also owned smartphones. Those are the two key ingredients that Uber connected to aggregate a pool of labor and capital. On the other side, there were people who needed rides. And Uber also then aggregated the demand for that labor and capital. And that's all Uber has done. And just by creating the aggregated demand and the aggregated labor and capital pool, Uber has created a $40 billion global business. That's all they had to do. There were no capital costs, there were no infrastructure costs, no regulatory costs. We can go on about that, but I will in a minute. Um, but it's from that simple insight that you can connect labor pools to create value. And once they realized that they could do it for folks who owned limousines, there was a penny drop moment, also probably caused by competition from another company called Lyft, that in fact there was nothing particularly special about a limousine. Why couldn't, for instance, Steve take his Yaris, pop open his smartphone, and start picking people up? And that was the genesis of an idea called UberX. And I had a lovely UberX slide in here until I saw your newspaper today, and I decided I was going to use that picture. <laughs> and this UberX is actually the tipping point into another kind of connected labor market, which I really want to talk about. It's a technologically mediated alienation of labor. You know, this is Marx's theory of labor in action, on speed. <laughs> and you, so you have, this, you have this idea, and this, of course, is an idea that's becoming pervasive. So a lot of other folks are being able to do things like this. And so you have now the emergence of a whole bunch of different sorts of connected labor vertical aggregations. Uber is a vertical aggregation in transportation. But I know some folks who have just funded a company from a venture capital firm in Australia who have founded a firm called Poshake. Poshake is almost the opposite. If you are a pet owner and you're going away for the weekend, you can get someone to take care of your pet. And the interesting thing about this is although you'll pay them for it, the pet, the person who's taking care of the pet really wants to take care of the pet for the weekend. Maybe they can't have a pet on their own. Maybe they really like pets. It doesn't matter. So it aggregates the demand for people who need to have their pets taken care of with a group of people who want to take care of pets, which seems weird and get amazing and kind of delightful all at the same time. But this is connected labor. Connected labor is finding all of these needs and then finding out there are actually all these people out there who want to fulfill these needs and then connecting them and raping 10 or 20, raking 10 or 20 percent <laughs> off the top. So there are vertical versions of connected labor markets, but then there are horizontal versions 
of connected labor markets, where you enter the connected labor pool, essentially as unskilled labor, and you sort of hunt around for something that might fit your capacities. And there's two examples that I want to give you, one from America and one from Australia. TaskRabbit is the example in America. Have any of you done any TaskRabbit work? Or hired any TaskRabbit work? All right, so the idea with both of these services is that you can essentially pitch yourself into a labor market and say, look, I have these capacities. And you can look around and see if someone needs dry cleaning picked up or if they need the uh, lawn mowed or if they need someone to walk the dog or whatever it might be. And it forms a market so that you can then say, okay, I'll do this, I'll do this at this time, I'll do it for this amount of money and you can negotiate. Now, this is very old fashioned. People were doing that on classified ads. People have been doing that on Craigslist for 20 years. But this is now the new version because it's all happening on smartphone. It's all entirely connected. There's basically no friction associated with that. And the thing about these connected labor markets is that they're really good at aggregating large numbers of individuals, which also then means that there's a lot of competition for any particular piece of work, which can then lead to a situation which is called the race to the bottom where people will continually underbid themselves until the low bidder basically doesn't have a substantial economic base to be able to make a profit from the sale of their labor, which is, again, something that Marx talked a lot about. Now, all of you are going to grow up and be professionals, and you probably think you don't have to worry about this, and unfortunately, that's already wrong, because one of the most successful startups to come out of Australia in the last three years is a company called Freelancer.com. If, for example, you are a designer or a webmaster or a PHP language, which is a programming language, you are now competing on Freelancer.com against someone in Pakistan who is very happy to take $20 an hour to do the work while you actually probably need 50, 60, or 70 in order to have a successful economic basis to be able to pay your rent. Because connected labor is no respecter of persons. Now, the thing about connected labor markets is that they're extremely fluid. And that means that it's very easy for labor to enter a connected labor market or exit, and for the demand for labor to enter and exit the market. It also means that it's incredibly difficult to be able to maintain any specific position in the labor market. And there was a brilliant, brilliant New York Times article from the 16th of August from last year. This is the opening photograph. This is a woman getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning because she works in the connected labor market. And she's about to, she lives in Massachusetts, and she's about to, via an Uber, drive someone to the airport. And what will begin? 26 hours of more or less continuous work combined with coming home and being a mom and doing all the other things because she's just re-entering the workforce after an illness. And she does Uber jobs and she does TaskRabbit jobs and she does all sorts of other jobs. And at the end of this 26 hours, she's really satisfied because she's managed to earn $263. And the thing that you realize as you're reading this, and the reporter actually asks her, do you think that this is sustainable? Do you think that you could keep this up? And as she says, she says, look, and I'm just getting started again. This is a way to keep the, the mortgage paid. You know, my husband is working. It's not quite enough. So it's important that I have access to these things. And it's important that I can earn this money in this irregular way. But yeah, I have been awake for most of the last 26 hours. And of course, in these situations, the way connected labor is working right now, labor is assuming most of the liabilities involved here, right? Insurance, uh, so on and so forth. And it's only receiving a portion of the benefit because there's an alienation factor. Some of the, some of the wage is being taken away to pay for the connection. Now, if this were a world designed by, say, Adam Smith or Ayn Rand, there would be an infinite supply of workers. 
And one of the most important things is the size of a labor pool in a given market. You know, in Chicago, the size of the local labor pool is going to be substantial, but in a smaller town, say Milwaukee, it's probably not going to be as large. Now, that's something that a freelancer doesn't have to worry about, because freelancer is truly virtualized work. You're asking someone on the other side of the world to do a web page design for you. Well, they can do that. But someone on the other side of the world is not going to be able to pick up your laundry. And that's the kind of thing that the generalized, unskilled labor pools do, like TaskRabbit, or Uber, or Aircaster. And so it's become clear now, just over the last 6 to 12 months, that connected labor pools actually need some sort of support if they're going to be persistent. And so what's happening now is that the labor aggregators, these companies, are starting to supply some of that support basically because they don't have any other choice, because their models will not be sustainable. Even though this is going to add costs and businesses hate to add costs, it's in the long term going to be the only sustainable way to run their business. Now, in Australia, I'm very happy to say we have Medicare. So we all have socialized medicine. We have public health. So I don't have to worry about paying my health insurance if I suddenly have to go to the hospital. But of course, that's not true in America. And so you're talking now about being able to provide workers with some of the services they're going to need so they can stay inside of a connected labor pool that isn't providing a lot of other support for them. And so what we're now starting to see, and where we are right now in 2015, is you're starting to see a negotiation. And it's not a negotiation that's happening, say, between a union and an organizational entity. It's almost more happening inside of the market itself because the market is so flexible. What you're doing is you're seeing a negotiation around flexibility. And one of the first points of that flexibility is insurance. Because what happens if you're doing a task and you get hurt or you hurt something that's happening um, on the client side? Who pays for that? What happens if you hit someone while you're driving an Uber? All of these questions have to start to get asked who's assuming the liability. And of course, the thing that the connected labor provider, like an aircaster, could do and what they did do is they actually went to Lloyd's of London and said, okay, we need an insurance policy that will allow us to insure our workers so that when they get hurt on the job, there's indemnification. Now, of course, in this case, this is probably to prevent air tasker from being sued. But it does also prevent the workers from being sued. So there's a penumbra of safety around that. That's, that's sort of one level. And that's, that's a good thing. It's a necessary thing. There's no regulatory requirement for this yet because most connected labor doesn't have any regulatory requirements around this. But that's sort of low hanging. We kind of need to cover that. I think the more interesting thing is when you start to get to things that are actually important to people. So we have this thing in Australia called compulsory superannuation. It's essentially a mandatory IRA. And when you have a full-time job in Australia, 9% of your salary is deducted and put into a savings account for you, which you get when you retire, and your employer matches that. And this is mandatory. It's not a pension plan. This is a personal superannuation fund that Australia has. I think because we've had it for 20 years, we have well over $2 trillion in management from the superannuation funds from Australia. It's 22 million Australians. And what we're starting to see now in Australia, which is where I've been doing my research, is that the superannuation funds are now starting to strike deals with the labor aggregators so that the folks who are participating in these connected labor markets can also put super away. But because this is a connected labor market and it's not full-time employment, there's no matching employee contribution. So you might be putting your 9% away, but there's not going to be another 9% coming from your employer. So again, the connected labor market is getting the shaft. But one of the companies that I study, one chance, <coughs> is actually starting to provide that service. And this is the, the web page. You can see down here, AMP Flexible Super. So superannuation may suit you if you're looking for super to take from job to job and is easy to manage. And that's their polite way of saying this is the right sort of superannuation for a connected savings market. And these are the kinds of products that people are going to need in order to have the flexibility to be able to work inside of connected labor pools. And I need to point out that connected labor pools will become the dominant form of employment over the 21st century. If I hadn't said that before, and if it wasn't clear to you, let me make that clear now. Now, one shift 
is a really interesting company because the kinds of market that they tend to serve have always been transient labor markets. They are very good in hospitality. So if you need a waitress or a bartender on very short notice, you can go to one shift and find that person for you, whether that's for a single shift, or for a week, or for a month, or for a season, or full time. And that market has always been there, but it's always sort of been word of mouth. Oh, we need someone on shift today. Does anyone know anyone? Could you call around? This business is becoming a monster in Australia. It's been growing by leaps and bounds because it's actually found a market that was already connected labor, but didn't have any really good connection mechanism. It's providing that connection mechanism. And so it's really meeting a need. Because it's doing so, the folks who are running that company are now starting to give a thought about what they need to do to retain the people in that labor pool. Because what's to keep another company from starting up and offering exactly the same service and taking their employment base away, right? There's no resistance here. You haven't signed a contract. There is no loyalty. Your only loyalty is to getting the next job in the connected labor market. All right. So this is when connected labor actually has some leverage. Now it's not, again, leverage that you'd have at the bargaining table, because it doesn't really have that sort of self-awareness. It's kind of like an unconscious animal that's only going to go where it feels most comfortable. And so now all these different connected labor aggregators are going to start to make themselves feel as comfortable as possible to the people who are offering that connected labor. And so one shift is offering insurance, it's offering superannuation. Those aren't all that interesting to you. The next thing they're about to offer is something they're interested in. You'd be interested in because they're going to start to offer education. The reason they're doing this is because what they want to do is they want to offer laborers in the pool of connected labor a way to level up on their skills. So they can gain skills, so they can get better jobs inside the labor pool. So they can continue inside of one shift and they can earn, but they can also continually add their skills as they're earning. That's the new face of connected labor. By the time most people become aware of what connected labor is, this is going to be the way it works. And when I learned about this, this, is, this was my penny drop moment. I learned about this the day before I got on a plane to come here. When I learned about this, I realized that we were about to witness this sort of collapse, this black hole-like collapse of the labor and the educational markets. Because this is the model. It's going to seem very new and weird and shiny for the next couple of years. And then 20 years from now, this is going to seem perfectly this is really what I want to talk about. So probably the best way to understand what this future is, is to imagine a scenario that places us into this future. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine ourselves round about 10 years from now, round about 2025 which is not very long. Someone who's entering Columbia as a freshman today, well, that's not that, they're, they're only gonna work in a few years after that. But we're gonna talk about uh, a girl, we're gonna call her Grace. And she's gonna enter high school in around 2020, 2021. And when she enters high school in 2020, 2021, she's going to be provided with a set of resources and tools that will help her in her learning. And some of those tools are going to be provided by the school that she's going to. Others are going to be found online. All these tools will talk to one another through the web because the web is everywhere and they'll all be on her smartphone because smartphones are everywhere. By the way, there will be 5 billion smartphones in the world in 2020. And she feeds all of these tools into a tool that she has, which is the workbook. The workbook is there to track her progress. It's her digital portfolio of the work that she's done. It's the connection to her teachers. It's the connection to her peers. 
both near, so in the classroom, and far, wherever they might be around the world. Because remember, this is the world of hypermimesis. So not only is she learning in a room, she's learning from everyone else everywhere. And the classroom that she's in doesn't close her in, but actually acts as the support to give her the capacity so that she can range widely. So that she actually has the capability to go around the world to find the people who are engaged in the kinds of learning that she wants to. And what is she doing? She's in the basic process of hypereducation, which is to connect and to share and to learn and then put that learning into practice so that she can connect and share and learn more. And from this point, she's always part of a community of people who are expert in something because her role in that community is to be the person who's learning from the experts in that community until she's expert enough to actually be able to pass on that expertise. And you don't actually have to be that expert in the community of experts to find someone who's less expert than you and be able to share with them. It's peer learning. Peer learning is amazing. She doesn't have a fixed idea of what she wants to do be in her life yet. But she knows what she likes, she has a direction, she has a passion. And because the people in her network, including her educators, can see her workbook, and from her workbook, understand what her passions are, they can use her passions to drive her learning, which is the essence of constructivism right there. And they can use that as a lure to deeper and deeper, deeper study. Okay, so Grace is getting close to the last year of high school. She hasn't settled down, per se. Her interests remain omnivorous. And her teachers aren't pushing her to make a decision about what to do. Because there's time, and in the world of 2025, there's a lot of flexibility. And it's around this time that Grace enters the labor pool. You know, Stephen and I both started working when we were around 16. At 17, we both had manual labor jobs. I was just down there in East Greenwich the other day. We would drive to work together. He worked at one plant doing something. I worked at another plant doing something. And of course, it's when you have your job in manual labor that you start to understand that maybe you want more in life than a manual labor job. But you kind of need that experience to inform that. And Grace, because she's entering the labor pool at the bottom level, unskilled, she's baker, you know, a butcher baker, candlestick maker, child care, all the sorts of things that unskilled labor tends to do. And she's in that labor pool, she's gaining experience, she's getting lots of different kinds of experiences. She's not particularly well paid for any of this, but she's also open to experiment. She's open to almost anything. And so she's moving through a range of occupations, sort of understanding both where her strengths are and her skills are and the things that resonate with her. And she knows from this that she actually does want something more about what. Well, the future is mostly open to her because she's a bright girl and her workbook reflects that. And because it reflects that, because it already has a sense of the kinds of things she knows, she can start to engage in a dialogue with the workbook. She can ask the workbook questions. What if I want to do this? Well, the workbook might say, this is probably the kind of position you can have now in that area based on the skills that you already have. These are the other capacities you would need to gain in order to have these other kinds of skills. So the workbook becomes a kind of oracle that she engages in a dialogue with so she can understand how she wants to skill up in order to get the kinds of capacities to get the kinds of jobs that she wants in a field that she finds interesting. And I think that's the core of what's going on here. And as she identifies a particular path with a particular set of skills, what happens? The workbook identifies the providers that can deliver those skills. Because the workbook isn't just about grace. The workbook is the integration of all of the educational resources that grace has access to. And some of those resources will be online, some of them are going to be online, some will come from community colleges, some come from universities, some will come from MOOCs, others will come from going to seminars and workshops. And racist education isn't just one thing. 
it isn't a four-year continuous path from a freshman to a bachelor's. It's a weaving pattern of opportunities, explorations, all of that within the pool of labor that's becoming more skilled than unskilled as she gains in her capacities. And each experience becomes a stepping stone to the next experience. Aspirational goals are reached. And she starts to get some of the opportunities that she has been seeking. Now, at this point, in the way we do education now, you think that Grace might just sort of leave education behind. And if she were done, she, in the world of 2015, that's where she would be done. We would sort of leave her with a set of capacities and a set of job opportunities. And we would say, that's, that's where we are. That's what the system is designed to deliver. But in 2025, everyone knows that learning is a lifelong process. It never ends. It might become more focused from time to time. And over the course of the decades, because Grace is probably going to live to be, what, 90 or 100 years old. She'll probably work well into her 70s, maybe her 80s. What's going to happen? She's going to change her job all of the time, because we have this immense flexibility in the labor pool. She's probably going to change the direction of her career at least every decade. And every time she does that, she will be connecting even closer to her workbook to find out what kinds of opportunities are available, what kinds of things she wants to do, and what kinds of educational resources she has access to to be able to realize those opportunities. And the educators around her are plugged in and listening and always aware and always ready to respond to her needs. Okay. So much of that scenario is desirable, and so much of it is plain fantasy. We have not designed our educational systems or our job systems for this kind of flexibility. But guess what? That flexibility is being forced on them. Because on one side, you have the increasing range of resources that are available online in a connected civilization to help people share and learn and grow their capacities. You have 11-year-olds who are functionally creating electrical engineering degrees by mind melding with websites. That's not going to be an accidental thing. That's going to be an intentional thing going forward. On the other side, you have this rapid evolution of the connected labor market that's providing an increasingly attractive alternative for both casual labor and skilled labor, both for businesses that are looking for flexibility and to lower costs, and for individuals who are looking for opportunities with flexibility. And neither of those trends are slowing down. Right now, both trends are happening outside formal institutional educational channels. <clears throat> so the response to that pressure has to be an embrace of the journey, both for the learner and the educator. Because you folks are connected for the long term. This is not one dance. This is a lifetime. And it's not just local. It's global. And that dance together over a lifetime globally changes both of you into something else. It's a world where education is never considered finished. And the institutions that deliver it are never static. All of it's dynamic. All of it's evolving. All of it is moving its speed. And that's the world of hyper-education. It's already emerging. I want to remind you of a quote from William Gibson. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So your job as educators is to go out there 
Look outside the box. Find out what other people are doing outside the academy. Study how people are learning, how learning has changed, how connecting and sharing and learning and hypermimesis have created a new environment for the student. And when you find those new systems, those new techniques, those new practitioners, those new futures, you need to rip them off blatantly. As Picasso said, good artists copy, great artists steal. So be great artists. For the students in this room, your job is to keep pushing hard. You have to keep demanding more. You have to demand that the world meets your insatiable needs for knowledge and for new capacities. Because it's that pressure multiplied by the thousands of you that will help the institutions transform themselves. And if they don't transform themselves, give yourself permission to invent new institutions. Hypereducation is already here. It's up to you as educators and students to decide how you respond to it. Can you embrace these new capacities? Because students already have. Thank you. <laughs>